this morning is Pentecost Sunday, and it is the birthday of the church. And you are going to notice that our pyramids have changed from red, celebrating the day, and next week they'll go back to green again, which is, of course, ordinary time and the time for our growth. Pentecost, which is 50 days after Easter, is when the Holy Spirit came to the other apostles and followers of Jesus in a large room in Jerusalem where they were waiting for a sign. Suddenly, the room was filled with sounds of wind blowing and tongues of fire landed on every single person, and they were forever changed. You'll notice that our banner this morning, our banner is representative, representative of the tongues of fire that fell on all of the people. They went out with gusto to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, and the world was forever changed. Later, the Apostle Paul had an encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, and he spent the rest of his life traveling on missionary journeys, telling others about this man, Jesus. Listen to what Paul said to the church in Thessalonica. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. So it is my hope and prayer today that we remember that we are chosen and that the Holy Spirit will land on each one of us this morning and will pour out his power on us as we learn more about David being in En Gedi in the cave. You see, David was a man after God's own heart. And may the words today be so convicting to us that as we continue to live our lives, we will never want to repay evil with evil. We will always want to repay evil with good. Well, so convicted by the Holy Spirit to share the good news of Jesus, missionary Jim Elliott and some of his friends decided that they were going to take the good news of Jesus to the Aka Indians in Ecuador. The Aka Indians were great hunters in the jungle, and they hunted barefoot with spears and arrows. They also hunted, as I said, barefoot, and they were able to, to look and figure out every single person's footprint in the jungle. But they also had many cruel customs. They killed anyone in the jungle that was not a part of their tribe. They also killed each other if there was the slightest quarrel. In addition, if mothers got tired of taking care of their children, they would kill them also. They didn't know about the love of God and the kindness that God expected every person to display. So Jim and his wife went out into the jungles and they found somebody to teach them the Aka language. They certainly were cut off from the outside world, but with the help of a young Indian woman who had escaped the Aka village because of great fear of being killed, she taught them their language and their customs. And so in no time, they decided, it is time for us to go out to this Indian tribe and to tell them about Jesus. But before they did, they decided that they would fly over the village in their airplane and drop gifts. So the first time they flew over, 
the, the Aka Indians ran in their huts afraid. The second time they flew over, they dropped gifts of shirts. Now the Aka Indians wore no clothes, but they gave them shirts and knives and candy and other gifts. And they noticed that the people were waving to them whenever they dropped the gifts. One time when the basket fell with gifts, the Aka Indians held onto it for a minute. And when it was raised up, there was a woven headband of feathers, a tame parrot, and a banana for that parrot to eat. They determined that the people were becoming more and more friendly. After a couple of months of dropping gifts, Jim and another friend landed the airplane on a beach right across from the Aka village. And that very day, three of the Akas came across the river to visit and said that they wanted to be friendly to their new friends. One of them said, will you take me for a ride in my airplane? They named him George, and they took him up in the airplane, and he laughed and smiled as they flew over the village. Well, the wives of these five men knew that they were going to try to go into the village, and they became extremely worried when they had not heard from their husbands in a few days. So trying to figure out what happened, another missionary flew over the village and came back with devastating news. All five men had been speared to death by the Aka Indians. You see, Jim and the other ones made it into the village, and as soon as they did, the warriors came right up on them and speared them to death. They actually had guns but they decided not to use their guns because if they did, the Aka, Aquas would never learn about Jesus. They let themselves be killed so that the people in the village would have another chance to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Very dramatic. They did not use their guns. They did not repay evil for evil, even though it took their lives. When well, our scripture today, David had the opportunity to kill Saul, his assailant, and he decided that repaying evil with evil was not a part of God's plan. You know the story. David was gaining in popularity with the people and Saul became intensely jealous of his son-in-law. Saul heard that David and 600 of his men were hiding in a cave in En Gedi. And so that's on the western shore of the Dead Sea. There the caves are very large, and I read that they could easily hold maybe even 1,000 people. They provided refuge, and they were cool as compared to the blistering heat that you find in the wilderness. Sometimes people stopped in one of those caves just to take a nap. But En Gedi was and is an oasis. It had plenty of water, and many things grew there, such as date palms. There was plenty for David and his men to eat. So Saul took 3,000 of his skilled soldiers, his best forces, his Navy SEALs, his paratroopers to find one man. They went into En Gedi, but David and his men were in a cave. Saul had a five to one advantage over David, who only had those 600 men. Well, nature does call, so Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. He had no idea what, deadly, uh, what a deadly predicament he had placed himself in. Can you imagine 600 pair of eyeballs watching you use the restroom in a cave? 
Well, at first, there was great fear when Saul went into the cave. The men got really excited, and they said, oh, my gosh, opportunity has come our way. Here are their exact words. This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands, and you can deal with him as you wish. The men thought this was divine intervention, and he could get rid of the enemy. But David refused to kill Saul. He had the opportunity, and Saul sought to kill David. But when the time came, David spared him. He would not repay evil with evil. David crept over because Saul had dropped his robe, probably at the entrance, and cut off a corner of that robe, which, by the way, in that time was absolutely degrading. The robe you wore let people know of what type of a person you were, whether you were royalty or whatever your status was. Immediately, David was stricken with a guilty conscience. He realized that God's spirit had come up on Saul in a powerful way. And Saul would, um, and God would oppose doing anything that would have hurt Saul. He told his men, it is wrong. It was wrong for me to do this. He says, if Saul is guilty, God alone will act as the judge. Now, David's decision probably shocked his men, but David respected the Lord and so he respected Saul. No payback today. His decision held his destiny. What are your thoughts on payback? Have you ever wanted to get back with somebody who hurt you or made you mad? Did they gossip about you, slander you, steal from you, make your life miserable at work? Hey, did they cut you off on the freeway? And you thought, I am going to get back at them. Were you tempted to give them the same thing they gave you? Actually, it's a very common temptation. And all of us have felt that temptation at one time or another. You can see on the news all the time, cases of revenge. I read where two neighbors were feuding with each other over many, many years. And one day, one got enough, he took a shovel, he went out, and he killed his neighbor. Payback? I don't think so. Yesterday, my granddaughter, Kate Spears, graduated from Ramstein High School in Ramstein, Germany. Obviously, we could not be there, so we got on YouTube to watch her graduate. And we're very proud she was valedictorian of her class. Most of the kids at that high school are American. Their moms and dads are there because the Air Force assigned them to be there. So as we were watching Kate graduate, there was a chat session going on on the side of YouTube. So anybody could type in and say, Go, Kate, we are so proud of you. Go, John, this is Grandma, I love you. It was really cool to watch the chat sessions, except for one person who was saying terrible things about these young men and women. He used foul language on every single thing the kids did. When the choir sang, he made fun of them. He called him devil, Satanist, and other horrible names and made nasty comments about the United States. Some people jumped right in and got right after him, saying nasty things. That only egged him on. So there was a bunch of nastiness going on, repaying evil with evil, until one woman got on there and said, just ignore him. Take down his name and report him for using foul language. And he began to back off. Well, here's what I thought as I was watching it. 
and I'm being honest with you. I thought, you creep, what are you doing? This is a wonderful day for all kinds of teenagers and their families, and you're trying to ruin it. I'm one of the grandmothers. You're trying to ruin it for me. My tendency was to go over to my keyboard and just fire off something really nasty, something that would get his attention. But I didn't. Maybe before I knew Jesus, I would have, but I decided I need to leave this alone and let God handle it. Well, I'm sure you all have read Victor Hugo's classic masterpiece, Les Miserables, and he tells the story of John Valjean, who was in prison for 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread. When Valjean got out, he had no place to live, but a friendly bishop took him in, and Valjean repaid that by stealing all of the bishop's silver. He was captured again and brought back in and taken to the bishop so the bishop could arrest him. But the bishop said, the silverware was a gift. Leave him here with me. And so the bishop looked at this man and said, use the silverware to become an honest man. And he did. The bishop did not repay evil for evil but he repaid evil for good. When temptation and payback come, and they will, how are we going to fight it? Well, I have some suggestions for you by reading this beautiful scripture. First of all, resist the temptation to harm anyone who opposes you in any way. Instead of taking action, take it to God. Yes, prayer is absolutely the most wonderful thing we can do when somebody opposes us. Sometimes we are so hurt by what somebody has done to us that we are not able to see the sacred worth of that person. But we have to remember that God loves them. He died for them too. And we have to keep that in our mind that he has a plan for their life and he has a plan for our life too. Additionally, we got to be really careful with our friends who try to encourage us. Sometimes we don't take it to God in prayer first. We take it to our friends and our friends try to give us the very best information that they can give us on how we should solve it. But you know, not going to God first can get us into big trouble. You know what the guys in the cave were saying, come on, David, fair is fair. Do God a big favor and get rid of him right now. David's men knew that David would never be king as long as Saul was alive. But David said, I have done wrong. I have cut the hem of his garment. I will not kill him because he is the Lord's anointed. David had taken a big step. He had listened to his conscience. He had listened to God his father, and then he moved on. Here's a second thing. Make every attempt to reconcile. David sought to reconcile with Saul at great cost to himself. If you read on in chapter 24, you'll see that David wanted to remedy the situation. And that's how we should approach our enemies. We don't need to sit back and wait for them to make the first move. God is giving us the strength and the power and the Holy Spirit for us to make the first move. I know a woman who was greatly hurt by some comments that were said about her. I watched her. She went straight home, she prayed about it, and she wrote a letter and got it out immediately trying to reconcile with that person. She didn't wait for that person to come to her. She took the first step. 
And then finally, we have to agree to be good to each other. David had promised Saul that he would do good for his household uh, as long as he happened to be the king. And you know, he did just that. He took care of Jonathan's son, brought him into the palace, restored all of his father and grandfather's land. And he mourned greatly when Saul died and he gave him a proper burial. He made sure that he kept his promise and he did good to Saul as long as he was king. Even though David lived 3,000 years ago, he is a great example for all of us. He trusted God and called on him over and over, and Psalms 142 and 57 were written while David was in the cave. I invite you to read them today just to see how much David trusted God. Even in the cave, David's heart and soul exuded mercy and the truth of God even in the darkness. He resisted harming Saul. It would have been very easy to kill, kill him, but he moved first and then he did good to his king. We've talked a lot today about people hurting us and what we should do to make that better. But we didn't say, what if we are the person who is holding the grudge, is angry with our relatives, a former spouse, a friend, a boss, or even one of our children? Is the temptation still lingering in your heart to get even with one of these people? What would it take today for you to forgive and take the first step towards reconciliation. God sent the Holy Spirit upon the people in Jerusalem with power, and we have that same power today. God's words are convicting, and what we heard today should shake us to the very core. I once held a grudge against somebody. It was a silly thing but I held that grudge for quite a while until one day reading my Bible and I was so convicted about what I was doing that I gave it to the Lord, I asked him to forgive me and I knew that he would take care of it. I went to a counselor to understand the whole situation more realistically and I decided to leave it at the altar. I tried to take the first step with the person, and actually it has been wonderful because we have been able to have a lot of mutual appreciation for each other. It feels so good to let go of all that and leave it with God. And I can promise you when we step into heaven, we will be so thankful that we did not repay evil with evil but we repaid evil with good. Whether you're the person who's hurt or you are the person that is hurting others, it's time to move. Don't stay where you are, deep in the cave of darkness. Come out into the light and let Jesus heal you. You have the example of one of the saints of God before you, and you have what it takes with the Holy Spirit in you. Let it go today and see what God will do. It may just amaze you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.